Hi guys! It is almost the end of August, so I thought that this would be a good time to do a recent reads wrap up of the nonfiction that I have read in July and in August. It is only three books because I tend to read nonfiction pretty slowly and on the side and spread it out over weeks. If it is enjoyable, if it's not enjoyable, and I don't read it primarily for enjoyment, I will speed through it no problem. And there is one book of the three that I'm going to talk about that I have read on two lunch breaks. I'll let you guess at the end which one it is. So without further ado, here are my July and August nonfiction reads. The first one I'd like to talk about is Cairngorm John by John Allen, aka Cairngorm John. Cairngorm John is John Allen's nickname. John Allen was a member of the Cairngorm Mountain Rescue Team between 1971 and 2007 and he was the team leader from 1989 onwards and as such became known as Cairngorm John and this nickname became so established that he could even answer the phone, the uh, rescue team's hotline, uh, with the name Cairngorm John. I suppose most viewers won't be familiar with the name Cairngorms. The Cairngorms are a mountain range in the eastern Scottish Highlands to the southeast of Inverness and they are comprised of some of the highest peaks on the British Isles. The highest peak in the Cairngorms, Ben Macdui, is the second highest mountain on the British Isles after Ben Nevis on the west coast and the eponymous Cairngorm mountain itself is the sixth highest peak I think on the British Isles. The Cairngorms are a popular outdoor sports tourism destination year-round and another thing that's year-round is the unpredictability of the weather which is one of the main reasons if not the main reason why accidents and other calamities happen in these mountains. People overestimate themselves and their navigational abilities for instance and they underestimate the terrain and the conditions which might seem benign one minute and the next you're in a blizzard and visibility is reduced to a few meters and temperatures will have dropped 10 degrees so when conditions change like that or people lose their way or have underestimated walking times and are surprised by nightfall some people will inevitably make the wrong decisions like walking on when they should have retraced their steps because they reason that the way back must be longer than the way forward or they judge incorrectly whether it is better to stay put in one, in one spot in relative safety or to brave the weather or the darkness and get down from the heights as quickly as possible. And of course also accidents of all kinds happen. Climbers fall down or walkers twist their ankles on loose rocks and aren't able to get down from the mountains themselves. And this is when mountain rescue comes in. All Scottish mountain rescue is made up of volunteers who do this after hours and at their own risk and for free. When helicopters are needed, they do get assistance from the search and rescue units of the Royal Air Force or of from the police, um, but apart from that they are all civilians. Um, they have to go begging for money all the time. They do have tax money allocated to them, but of course it's never enough. Um, in many of the popular tourist um, outdoor tourism destinations, um, the pubs and restaurants will have tip jars where you can make donations for them. Just saying. So this is basically a history of the Cairngorm Mountain Rescue Team as far as John Allen witnessed it. And it is an assortment of cases and rescues that he was involved in that are in some way either particularly spectacular or particularly representative. Spoiler alert, most of these cases end in death, <laughs> which is a little depressing. And I hope that at least that aspect isn't representative after all. Um, John Allen also discusses broader issues like financing and insurance and the question of payment and he also discusses medical issues um, that come up in mountain rescue. For instance, how pain medication is administered, which is interesting, or um, the, the issue 
of resuscitation and first aid on the mountain and the differing and changing views of the medical community and of the mountain rescue community and the first responders. So that was interesting, but on the whole I have to say I was colossally underwhelmed by this book, especially by the quality of the writing, which is nowhere near as high as those mountains, let me tell you. It seemed to me that somebody had approached John Allen and said, hey, you've had such an interesting life, why don't you write about it? And he did, <laughs> although he's clearly no writer and among other things he didn't seem to have a clear concept of the difference between memoirs and an autobiography. For instance, feel free to disagree with me in the comments, but I really don't think that for the topic at hand, the Kerngorm Mountain Rescue, we needed the history of his trainee years at Boots in any way. Like I said, feel free to disagree with me. And then when we get to the mountain rescue years, it is more or less just an enumeration of cases and rescue missions. And Alan does try to put them in a wider context. He introduces each chapter um, with a broader subject or an interesting piece of trivia or a folk tale or some historical information. And then he zooms in on the cases and tries to recur to the introduction at the end. But I have to say that in most cases this seems a bit forced and clumsy to me. And then at times I found myself violently disagreeing with him. Particularly it got on my nerves that he was trying so damn hard all the time to be nice and to avoid saying anything that could be deemed controversial by anybody. And in some cases I thought that being nice was really uncalled for. Like for instance in the case of the bloke who took his eight-year-old daughter into the mountains and then promptly lost his way and the little girl ended up freezing to death. John Allen says, oh, the parents have suffered enough and harsh words are really uncalled for. And I think, no, parents like that should be publicly denounced and shamed in addition to criminal charges. Not because I think that they need to be pu punished in this way, but as a signal to the public that behavior like that is unacceptable because you just don't do that. You don't take a person who is legally in your charge and who has no way of consenting or not consenting or even making an informed choice like a ten, an eight-year-old child into the mountains where there are no, no marked paths, no signposts, very few distinct landmarks where you know that the weather can change any minute and where people die from overestimating themselves every year. You just don't do that. The topic of responsibility or the lack thereof came up here and there in the book and John Allen was always, like I said, trying to be nice and he often took what seemed like the coward's way out of the discussion. Yeah, so <sighs> that got on my nerves, but on the whole I thought that his views were very circumspect and unproblematic most of the time. So on the whole, even though the book wasn't enjoyable for me, I think that it is a good introduction to the topic of Scottish Mountain Rescue. Um, if you want to learn more about it, about the topic without buying the book, I have linked you to some resources in the description box. Moving on to this beautiful book, Under the Rock by Benjamin Myers. This is a very interesting piece of nature slash place writing um, coupled with memoir. Benjamin Myers and his wife fled London in their early 30s and settled in the village of Mythamroyd in West Yorkshire. This is a tiny village to the northeast of Manchester. It is the hometown of the poet Ted Hughes. Um, Haworth, where the Bronte sisters came from, isn't very far to the north either. The next large town would be Huddersfield to the southeast, um, which is the hometown of the uh, poet Simon Armitage. I mention all these names because they all play a role, and, and uh, literature and culture, culture in general play a role in the book too.
This is kind of a biography, if you like, of the Calder Valley and the village of Mythamoid, seen through a very personal lens. It is about the social and the cultural history of the place, and at its center is always the landscape and the way it has influenced people's thinking, or in the case of creative people, how it has shaped their artistic development and, and the products that they have created. And above all looms Scout Rock, the rock of the title, which is a large looming presence in the valley and overhangs the village and casts it in its shadow and seems to be always in the back of people's minds, um, at least in the back of the mind of the author and of most of the people that he writes about. For instance, Ted Hughes, who is an extreme example, I think, um, and who all his life seemed seems to have felt like he couldn't escape the shadow of the rock and he writes about it in several of his poems. And the rock isn't actually all that harmless either. Um, there's always the threat of landslides, but in addition to that it also has a rather sinister history as an illegal asbestos dump. Um, when a nearby asbestos factory closed, they just dumped all their material on the mountain and covered it with earth the mountain, the rock. <laughs> now asbestos of course is harmless when it is covered with earth and it only becomes dangerous and carcinogenic when it becomes airborne and is inhaled. But of course that can happen and it can come loose. For instance in one of those landslides, like one of those that are caused by the frequent floods. The narration of the book culminates in one of those floods, the most recent one, I think, in 2015, when the river Calder swelled so much that it drowned the whole valley and displaced a lot of people for a prolonged period of time. I enjoyed this book a lot, but I did think that the highly personal note made it all seem a bit disjointed and lacking in structure and purpose and some sort of guiding principle. Um, the different sections of the book, big chapters, um, all do have a main theme, but it is not enough to hold each chapter together, I thought. It always seemed that Benjamin Myers delivered a certain piece of trivia when he happened to think of it, more so than in other pieces of nature writing that I've read. I think it's a form of high art to make your nature writing seem at once associative and adhering to a consistent narrative. And I'm afraid in this book I didn't see that realized that well. I still enjoyed reading about the place a lot though. Give me anything Yorkshire and I'll gobble it up, except maybe for the Brontes. And I think if you are at all interested in the Calder Valley and, and Yorkshire in general, this book will give you a fantastic overview. And now for something completely different. Optimism Over Despair is a collection of short interviews with Noam Chomsky, conducted and compiled by the reporter CJ Polychonio. The topics range from international politics to American society in the Trump era and populism worldwide, global warming and the escalation of capitalism and the class divide. Um, so in short, all major issues of at least the last five years. The title Optimism Over Despair is really only a summary of the last interview and the message that Chomsky leaves the reader with. Um, I will read it to you. It is very short. It's only one question, one answer. Question. Are you overall optimistic about the future of humanity given the kind of creatures we are? Chomsky. We have two choices. We can be pessimistic, give up and help ensure that the worst will happen. Or we can be optimistic, grasp the opportunities that truly exist and maybe help make the world a better place. Not much of a choice. If you have read The Nickel Boys or if you have watched my recent video on them, you will notice a common theme there. Isn't that neat? To be honest, I didn't really get what kind of reader this book is intended for. If you are familiar with Noam Chomsky or 
even just with the topics discussed in this book, in which case you will most likely have stumbled over Noam Chomsky's views on this, these topics as well. If you are familiar with them, this book offers absolutely nothing new. On the other hand, if you are unfamiliar with them, I doubt that this is enough to serve as an introduction, as it is very short, very concise and demands a good bit of back knowledge from the reader. The only thing that I thought that this book was really good for in my case is that it gave me some ammunition for future discussions. But yeah, this is an odd little book and I don't quite know what to do with it. So yeah, non-fiction has been a bit meh in these last two months. I just really need to get around to reading Robert McFarlane's Underland, which I just know will be fantastic. It was awarded the Wainwright Prize for Nature Writing two weeks ago, and I think it was about time that Robert McFarlane was awarded this prize. I also want to get around to reading, or at least starting, James Harriet's dog stories. James Harriet is the author of the memoirs All Creatures Great and Small, and I think it's safe to say that he is the world's most famous vet. Um, and he's from Yorkshire, and the book is about dogs, so it cannot not be fantastic. The next time I see you, it will be with a wrap-up of Agatha August, which is very exciting. And I hope that I won't have to film that video during a thunderstorm. So, I'm sorry again about the bad lightning. Lighting. Lightning outside, lighting inside, Eva. Um, so yeah, anyhow, have a nice day.